This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. Okay, thanks very much for coming along this evening, everyone. Uh, particularly on a damp night and when there's a cheap strike, we're really appreciative of this. Um, but a particular thanks to um, Joe Tynan for coming along. Um, we're delighted to have you here. This is an event which has been organised um, thanks to an Arts and Humanities Research Grant to provide quantitative uh, training for humanities students. And so this training is precisely to involve face-to-face -face seminars to talk to an arch exponent and practitioner of statistical data and how best to interpret it. Um, and so we're going to have a, an excellent practical exercise in this presentation. Um, Joe Tynan himself is Director of Political and Social Research for Europe, Middle East and Africa at YouGov and founding director of the company back in 2000. Um, and I'm pleased to say that according to his website statistics today, as an update, Labour's lead in the polls is 39%, uh, the Conservatives are 33 uh, with Hugh Kip at 13, which helps to explain why the Tories are quite so concerned about um, the type of data that, that Joe is gathering going forward. Yeah, I could talk about that until I'm blue in the uh, face. Anyway, so, um, Joe, if I can Thank you. you. Uh, shall I sit down or shall I stand up? I'm not sure. I feel kind of like uh, I'm, uh, you're all interviewing me. <laughs> so, so we'll do uh, we'll do it. Yeah, I, I might stand up. I might stand up. And I might sit down later. Sorry? The event has been filmed, and if you stand up, you will be on camera. And we. Okay. <laughs> I'll sit down. Then. No, no, it's fine. It's fine. It's fine. Yes, yeah, exactly. There's nothing like a bit of standing up for spontaneity. Um, I, I should, uh, I should say, I do, um, not wishing to blow my trumpet, I do a lot of TV work, uh, and I'm on, I'm probably on TV somewhere in Europe about once a week. Okay. You may have seen me on Austrian TV last week, in fact, TV. talking about Europe, or uh, News 24 talking about Amanda Knox yeah. um, after being invited on to talk about immigration, which was rather. Uh, Rather difficult switch. But um, the reason I mention that is on one occasion I was told that I was too tall to be interviewed. And, uh, and I said, Well, can you adjust the camera? And they said, No. <laughs> so, uh, so that's good. Uh, and on another occasion on Brighton Beach, I had to dig a hole in the beach to stand in it and then create a mound next to the hole so that the interviewer could stand on that. Uh, so, yeah, Bill Turnbull for BBC Breakfast. It's only this big. Um, <laughs> essentially, it could be a circus to walk. Uh, right. <laughs> so, uh, thanks, thanks to. Can everyone hear me in the back? Okay, yes, good. Uh, thank you to. Thank you to. I don't know whose this is. Is this yours? Yes. Good. Thank goodness for that. Um, I've been. I've been. Uh, yes. <laughs> I've been asked uh, to uh, talk to you guys about uh, about quantitative uh, quantitative methods. Quantitative methods is actually something that obviously I'm intimately involved in with work, but also something that I uh, lecture on quite a lot at, uh, at various academic institutions up and down the country. And basically, I could talk for the rest of the week uh, about this, but uh, but instead, what I've tried to do is distill the most important points down into around about sort of an hour, and then we can have a, a chat after that. Uh, so is the uh, so is the hope. Um, as we're going along, though, please do feel free to ask questions. I feel there's uh, there's enough of us to uh, to make that worthwhile. But I understand that obviously, obviously you may uh, you may not want to ask questions uh, without some sort of incentive, uh, which is of course what we're all about at uh, you guys. So I have been we'll pleased to know brought along some incentives that I'll be handing out in exchange for good quality questions. Uh, I have um, because there are 29 of you. <laughs> uh, I've brought along uh, four packs of YouGov playing cards. Uh, YouGov playing cards, uh, I mean, obviously, on their own, they'd be exciting enough, but, um, uh, but each card has a different statistic on there. Uh, so if you memorise the statistic, you can then work out what hand someone's got, and then say, oh, I would have thought that would be fine. Um, four YouGov pens, made of the finest plastic, uh, and... Um, how many? Uh, I can't give you all of these. Two, you got key rings. Uh, now again, you got key rings in themselves are quite exciting, uh, but they have a token that you can remove. You can then use in shopping trolleys, uh, 
uh, you know, if you happen to shop at the kind of place that requires a token. Um, and for the, for the best question of the evening, I have a YouGov jigsaw uh, to, to hand out. Yeah, exactly. Because what's not fun about a double-sided black and white jigsaw? So we've got all that going. Um, this is my first and possibly only year at the uh, teaching, <laughs> sort of lecturing at the, uh, the school of advanced study, uh, but I'm going to be talking about what I think is the most important aspect of quantitative research, specifically differentiating between significant and meaningful public opinion data. Now, many of you may be familiar with data that's in the public domain, you may have even commissioned your own quantitative work, but how do you know if it's actually any good? And I'm going to run through examples because that's what today is about. Another title for today uh, could be, for instance, Spotting Stupid Stats. Uh, that's, uh, that's, one way of, uh, that's one way of looking at it. Uh, a bit of housekeeping before we start. Please do follow me on Twitter, as I'm sure you can appreciate. I'm hilarious. But also, if I hand out a lot of info useful information and, uh, and data, you can find me at Joe Twyman. And because we're all digital natives, I thought we could use, thought we could use a hashtag for tonight's event, specifically the most fun ever. Uh, so if we could all use, uh, we could all use that, that'd be, uh, that'd be great. Work, Joe works better when there's 29. Uh, I want to start by talking about specifically uh, two quotes uh, that are often thrown at me um, from, uh, uh, from the world of polling. The first is uh, lies, damn lies, and statistics. I get that a lot. Uh, that's, uh, uh, that was uh, first said maybe by Benjamin Disraeli, but uh, as someone pointed out, it might have been Mark Twain. Nobody's really sure. I don't think it really matters. More importantly, uh, where are we? People can come up with statistics to prove anything, Kent. 40% of people know that. Uh, and that's from, uh, that's from Homer Simpson. So really the two main quotes that, uh, that uh, provide the context for my professional life come from Benjamin Disraeli and, uh, and Homer Simpson. So that raises the question, well, uh, the key question indeed, why use polling? Why do people use polling? Well, the answer is, to find out what people think. Uh, that's most often the uh, most often the case. At least that's why you should uh, why you should use good polling to find out the answer to something, to, to prove or disprove a hypothesis. Uh, you're familiar, you're all smart people, and so you're familiar with all the reasons for why people use quantitative uh, quantitative polling. But that raises the question: Well, what is good polling? What do we mean when we say good polling? And the answer to that, I think, comes from this quote: Data that accurately represents and reports the opinions of the population it is trying to research. So that, for me, is the key to good polling. And who said that? Well, I did. I couldn't find a better quote, uh, so I thought I'd, uh, thought I'd use it. That's the face I adopt when I'm annoyed, uh, just so, um, so you need to be familiar with. Now, why do, we need, uh, why do we need good polling, and how do we know what is good polling? Well, uh, to emphasize the importance of good polling, I developed um, I've developed something uh, that I think is, uh, is very easy to remember. I hope you will too. In order to explain it, we have to go back to a long time ago in a galaxy far, far away, uh, specifically with Star Wars. Now, can, uh, can somebody tell me the first Star Wars film? First Star Wars film to be released. Anyone? Has anyone here seen Star Wars? <laughs> It's going to be such a painful experience. A new hope. Well done, sir. Ten points for you. Uh, can you tell me, though, the second film to be released? Seems the Empire Strikes Back. No, I'm afraid you lose 20 points. So you're on minus 10 and the rest are on zero, I'm afraid. The second film actually to be released, as some of you will be familiar with, is the Star Wars Holiday Special of 1978, where uh, this character here, Chewbacca, went back to his home world, pictured here with his family, and we met for the first and only time his, uh, his child, uh, wo wo lump lump a wookie, a wookie kid. What has this got to do with anything? Here's the answer. Yeah, at the back, at the back, I can see it looks good. I can't believe we're writing this first. <laughs> <laughs> what has this got to do with anything? Wookid. Something tells me you'll probably remember the word wookid now. Why is that important? Because of the wookid hierarchy of outcomes. Wookid, or to put another way, you start at the bottom with data. From data, you gain information. From information, you get knowledge. Knowledge leads to understanding, and understanding leads to wisdom. Quantitative research will give you the data, and if you're lucky, 
the information. But if you don't get that right, none of the rest will be right either. You need to build the right foundations in order for all further stuff to line up. It doesn't matter how good your multi-level regression analysis might be, if the data you're feeding in is wrong, the conclusions you draw will be wrong. And it won't be your fault unless you didn't bother to check whether the data was good enough. We have a phrase in research, <coughs> in professional research, uh, BIBO. This is uh, this often used, and that's short for bollocks in and bollocks out. In other words, if you put in uh, uh, yes, it, yeah, there you get the idea. Other, uh, other countries have other terms for it. In America, the term lipstick on a pig is very common. Uh, you can put lipstick on a pig, it's still a pig. Or there's only so many ways to polish a turd, it's still a turd. And so, what does any of this mean? Let me give you an example of how things can go wrong. I'm going to talk about this woman here. This is a woman called Brooke Magnati, who was a research scientist from the University of Sheffield, where I went. Hooray! It's a bit like the University of London, just a bit better. Uh, <laughs> I'm joking, because it's a lot better. Uh, so, Brooke Magnati was at the University of Sheffield as a research, research chemist, I believe, but she's more famous as the prostitute blogger Belle de Jour. And she wrote a book on sex work, and in her book, she draws, uh, draws conclusions from two different studies. Two different academic, peer-reviewed, published studies. The first, prostitution and trafficking in nine countries, an update on violence and post-traumatic stress. Secondly, beyond gender, an examination of exploitation in sex work. Why am I telling you these uh, two citations? Well, because both studies, both peer-reviewed, both published, ask the same question. The percentage of sex workers wishing to stop working in the industry within the next three years. Both ask the same question at the same time to the same sample. And what did they find? Farley et al. found that 89% of sex workers wished to stop working within the industry within the next three years. Jenkins found that that figure was 3%. Which one is right? Neither. They're both wrong. Why are they both wrong? Because neither, in neither case did they bother to actually examine the data that they had. So they got the data and the information wrong and everything else on the working scale fell apart. So, Bit of a problem. Leads to the ultimate questions then. The ultimate questions that you must ask yourself if you're commissioning your own quantitative research, if you're viewing somebody else's research, or if you're just looking at research in the public domain. Generally speaking, the two questions you need to ask are firstly, is it significant? Is this data, is this individual finding, is this result significant? But secondly, and perhaps more importantly, is it meaningful? Now, in order to explain that, we have to look at the simplified process polling. And this is what the simplified process polling looks like. This is the, uh, the process that we go through. And at each stage, problems can occur that can lead to things being insignificant or not meaningful. But you need to think, therefore, about key questions to ask of the process in order to establish whether something is significant or meaningful. And I'm going to go through each of these key questions in turn. The first key question is who is answering the questions. Now, this is a really good way of finding out if something significant. Who is answering the questions? It, we refer here to the general theory of sampling. The general theory of sampling, I will not bore you with, but it basically goes like this. Draw a sample of respondents from a population that actually represents that population. And people have different ways of doing it. There's the, there's the uh, much, uh, much held in random probability sample that some of you may, may be familiar with, and other such things. But no matter what you do, you get your population and you need to select people from that. That can be a group of people all wearing fleeces and jeans that you found on the internet, or it can be a band from the 1970s. In each case, you need a way of selecting those respondents. But it's not just how you select them that's important. It's also the number of people that are selected, because that can be hugely important in determining significance. What that comes down to, then, is what we call the margin of error. And many of you will be familiar with the margin of error. What it means in theory is, quote, the true figure for the entire population is estimated to fall within plus or minus X percent of the data with 95% confidence in That's what margin of error means. What it actually means in practice is that people write on at the bottom of the survey, margin of error equals 3%. 
So, what does that mean? It means that the true figure for the entire population will be within plus or minus 3% of the data, 19 out of 20 times. I should say, I'm going to make a copy of this available uh, so, uh, uh, so you, don't need to, um, you don't need to record all this because there's a lot of stuff and I'm rushing through. Thank you. It's okay. I know you wouldn't want to go without the picture of Star Wars. So, um, and many of the other great pictures to come. Google image search is how I do my presentations. Anyway, so uh, margin of error. What that looks like, uh, in order to calculate the margin of error, you use the following equation. Uh, 0.98 over n, where n is the, uh, is the sample size. And this assumes a 95% confidence interval, simple random sampling in a sample that consists of less than 5% of the total population being surveyed. Or in other words, um, if, you, uh, if you're doing more than 5% of the total population being surveyed, then you need to include the finite population correction. I know it's not laugh out loud entertaining, but I'm just running through it so you've got it anyway. What is that, uh, how does that work in practice? Let's say you have a room full of 60 people. Imagine that. Imagine a room of 60 people. And, uh, and you survey 10 of those people. This is how it works out in terms of the, uh, in terms of the numbers. And here's how the margin of error works out. And that's important because anything that falls outside the margin of error is therefore determined to be statistically significant. And so in research, when we use the term significant, it means statistically significant or outside the margin of error. Here's how the, uh, here's how the margin of error looks in terms of a graph. And please note it's one of the few graphs in the entire presentation. Right. And as you can see, it's certainly not a linear scale. And significant gains can be made in margin of error at low sample sizes, but as you get higher, it's very different. Now this is important, of course, if you're commissioning research, because to get another 1,000 respondents from 1,000 to 2,000 will get you a big saving in margin of error from 1,000 to 2,000. But from 7,000 to 8,000, very little saving at all. But of course, the price to go from seven to 8,000 or from one to 2,000 is often very similar. And so it's a, it's a consideration that has to, be, uh, has to be made. Usefully, you can quite often get statistical packages, uh, analytical software, or indeed people that you've commissioned to work to produce these, these significance tables. And these are used to highlight those statistically significant differences. And some of you may be familiar with these. They, uh, they put little letters next to them and say, right, these differences are significant. And so that tells you if things are significant. But the crucial bit here, the elephant in the room, if you like, is this bit here. As a 95% confidence is we'll find, assuming simple random sampling. And a sample consists of less than 5%. But this is the important bit, simple random sampling. Simple random sampling, commercially, unless you're willing to pay millions of pounds, doesn't really exist anymore. Why? For a whole host of reasons, and I don't want to go into uh, it's too much detail about it, but there are things like response rates, people don't respond, uh, and, and various, other, various other problems with contacting people. So if you think, if, uh, if you're serving an entire country, everyone has to stand an equal chance of being selected. And that's not true in a country like Britain even, where someone in the Outer Hebrides and the uh, Scottish Islands stands a significantly smaller chance in commercial terms, because it's far more difficult. And you may say, all right, well, what about doing things on phone? And that's true, but what about the people that don't have landlines and just have mobiles? What about the people that don't have mobiles and just have landlines? It gets very, very difficult. So instead, people have developed various forms of non what we call non-probability samples. But then once you get that, you move away from the simple random probability sampling and move away from standard margin of error. So instead, different organizations will present their margin of errors in different ways. For instance, they will just ignore the fact they're not using random sampling. They'll say the sample size of the survey is 2,000, the margin of error plus or minus 2%. So that's one way, just ignoring that it's non probability. Then there's comparison and distraction. The sample for this survey is 2,000. The margin of error for a simple random probability sample of this size is plus or minus 2%. So you're not saying what yours is, it's just there. Then there's referring to your track record. The sample size of this survey is 2,000. Our previous results have shown our margin of error to be plus or minus 2%. Or you can make up your own. The sample size of this survey is 2,000. The notional margin of error is plus or minus 2. What's the notional margin of error? Nobody knows. Nobody cares. Doesn't matter. <laughs> so, that's the first thing about the number of people that are taking part. But also it's to do with not just the number, but the type of people. 
Let me give you an example of why size isn't everything, says the guy six foot four in the front. The Downing Street e Petitions website. Now, there have been a couple of incarnations of this. President Obama's done a similar thing in the States. The idea is you let people go onto the government's website and raise issues. And if enough people um, support that, then it has to be debated by the President or the Congress or, or in Parliament or, or whatever. Um, uh, Piers Morgan recently had one to have him deported from the US, for instance. Sadly, that didn't take place, but you know, we live in hope. Unless he's deported back here, in which case that would be an absolute disaster. So I think maybe just incarcerated would be better, but that's not part of the petition. Anyway, Downing Street Team Petitions website. This is what it looked like first time around when they did it in the UK. And when they did it in the UK, uh, they stupidly, first time around, described things as surveys and then talked about the people who went on there as respondents. What a brilliant idea, all described by a government minister as an own goal thought up by Pratt. Uh, why? Well, for things like this. We, the other side, petitioned the Prime Minister to scrap the planned vehicle tracking and road pricing policy. 1.8 million respondents agreed with that. And so I got phone calls from journalists. Do we have any journalists here? No, they probably couldn't find their way here. I got phone calls from journalists saying, well, hang on, your surveys have 2,000 respondents. This survey has 1.8 million respondents. That must mean yours is not as good. And I said, well, no, actually, we sample things in, uh, in a more structured way. We, uh, we use something called active sampling. We make sure that we ask the right people in the right proportions. We make sure that we accurately represent the population we're trying to research. This does not do that. This is a free fall. People can go on and ask as many times as they like. And I tried to explain that, and he didn't really get it. So instead, I pointed to some of the other surveys on the uh, e petitions website that also had over a million people agreeing with them. These included, we, the other side, petitioned the Prime Minister to replace the national anthem with gold by Spandau Ballet, uh, which, <laughs> it's a great song, I'm sure we're like, yeah, exactly, you can't always believe in your soul. Uh, yeah, great song, not sure I want to sing it at the Olympics. And then we, the other side, petitioned the Prime Minister to make Jeremy Clarkson Prime Minister. No, no matter, exactly. Absolute disaster. Uh, and so this is an example of what's called passive sampling. Passive sampling is a free for all. As many people as that like can just pile in and take part. And uh, <laughs> it goes wrong an awful lot. Time magazine. Time magazine every year, as you know, does Man or Woman of the Year. Okay? Uh, in previous years, previous winners have included both Hitler and Stalin. Yeah, it's true. So you're in good, you're in good company if you win that. Uh, but anyway, they, um, they have problems with their first annual Time 100 poll, and then their second one. They put it on the internet and they, and they kept having people with problems with people piling in. So for the third version, they said, you know what, we're going to fix this. We challenge the internet community to try and affect this result. We're going to find the most influential person in the world by allowing as many people to take part as possible. Do you want to know who the winner was? There he is. Does anyone know who the winner is? No, it's a guy called Moot. No? <laughs> okay. Moot runs a website called 4chan, uh, which is a, uh, which is, a, you heard of 4chan? Yeah, there's someone who is a big fan of pornography. Uh, so it's, a, it's an image, uh, it's an image exchange board, isn't it? Uh, and, uh, and they have, um, they have various, uh, they have various things that go on, and one of the things they decided to do was to influence the Time 100 poll after being, uh, after being, Goaded by the uh, goaded by the magazine, and so they programmed this. This was programmed from scratch. It is an auto voter, uh, and it circumvented the uh, security software that they had in place, and it broke Time Magazine. The group that did this from 4chan then adapted it when they became a group, a splinter group called Anonymous, which you may have heard, and attacked organisations like Visa and um, and Amazon over WikiLeaks. The thing that they used for this was used for denial of service attacks, having previously been used for that. Uh, they were so smart they managed to uh, get Moot to the top, but they also managed to spell out Marble Cake, also the game, uh, which if you're on 4chan is hilarious. Uh, so that gives you an idea of just because a lot of people take part doesn't necessarily mean something's good. At the other end of the scale, if you have very few people take part, it can still be meaningful. How? Uh, well, we've been contacted in the past by people who said, we'd like to speak to Roman Catholic Cardinals on your panel, please. Roman Catholic Cardinals. Why? Because they wanted to know who was going to be the new Pope. I don't know how many Roman Catholic Cardinals they are. 
I'm uh, you know not of that uh, of that tribe. But I can promise you, you speak to twenty Roman Catholic cardinals. You only speak to twenty, and you get their views, and then it's still useful. If you speak to thirty people who are CEOs of FTSE 500 companies, and it's still going to be meaningful findings. Yes, statistically they may not be significant, but they will be meaningful, and people will be interested in it. You need to think about how you use that data and critically evaluate, but it's still useful. Heads of Commonwealth countries, if you've got 50, 53 Commonwealth countries and you speak to the heads of 30 of those countries, the sample size is only 30, it's still hugely, hugely powerful. So, who is taking part in the polling? That's the first question. The next key question to ask, who commissioned the polling? Why do we ask that? Why? Because a lot of people are dishonest. And a lot of people use polling for one thing and one thing only, to either promote themselves or to promote a particular cause they're going after. And anyone who wants to see evidence of that can see the, uh, can see, can see the questionable poll published by the RMT over the tube strikes that was published yesterday by a company that shouldn't exist uh, and um, who I won't name while the camera is on. Uh, so, lots of people commission things for various weird reasons. PR companies, particularly good at this. Uh, some of you may have seen Have I Got News For You, so we're going to play Missing Words Round. We were contacted by a company saying, we don't care what you do, we don't care what questions you ask, all we want is the answer, Lancashire Hot Pot causes, anyone? Remember, cards and jigsaws on offer. No, the answer, constipation hotspot. All we had to do was get them that headline. How, how often does that happen? Hmm, about once a day. So, there are a lot of companies out there that use things purely for PR, and these are effectively bullshit polls, part of the expression. Let me give you an exa another example. Here's a good idea. If you see a picture of a woman in a bikini accompanying some survey findings, it's probably not scientific research. Let me give you examples of how often that happens. This is a woman called Katie Hill, used to be a uh, presenter on a TV show called Blue Peter. Here she is in a bikini. Why am I showing you this? Because she looks an awful lot like this. Uh, she your address from the Bond film Doctor No. Why is that important? Well, because the iconic scene in the 1962 Bond movie in which a stunning honey rider emerges from the surf singing herself has been voted the most inspiring bikini moment in history. <laughs> A survey by diet supplement LipoBind found most slimmers use Andres' curves as inspiration for their beach body diets. It was only after a combination of going to the gym on a daily basis and taking LipoBind, Katie went from a size 16 to a size 10 over a five month period. Yes, it, was in the, it must be true, I read it in the Daily Mail. <laughs> and it's easy to laugh at the Daily Mail, as we all know, but they're not the only ones. We could, for instance, refer to brides who have cosmetic surgery, or, uh, or truckers and lawyers being the fattest male professions, or people wanting a figure like Kelly Brook, or uh, uh, British women developing muffin tops. And in all cases, for more information, visit lipobind.com. Are they significant? No. Are they meaningful? No. Are they absolute bullshit? Yes. We can believe that. Um, so, very, very important. Who is, uh, but also more than that, other questions? Who is asking the questions? So not who's commissioned them, as we looked at previously, but who's asking the questions? Why is that important? Because there's a jungle out there, jungle represented here by a swimming pool. What that means is there are lots of different research agencies that commission work. Some are good, some are not as good. At the general election in 2010, 12 different organisations commissioned work on at some stage over the campaign. Some were close, some were not, some were good, some were not, some were honest, some were dishonest. How do you know? Unless you happen to be an expert on the polling, uh, on the polling industry within specific countries. Well, there are specific questions you can ask regarding transparency. And any legitimate, authoritative, essentially trustworthy company will be able to answer these questions. What are they? Firstly, 
Do they have a postal address, telephone number, and website? And you'd be amazed at the number of companies that don't. RNB Research, mentioned in the last list, do not have any of those things. Can you access full data tables of results? So can you see the actual questions that are being asked? Can you see how they analyze the results, how they break them down? Do they disclose fully their methodology, the way that they do their polls? If not, why not? Do they have a track record independently verified against actual outcomes? For instance, general elections or, or indeed whatever else you can, act, uh, you can verify it against. Are they cited in academic literature? Most of the major organisations are, but a lot aren't. Are they members of, in Britain, the British Polling Council, the Market Research Society? These are trade organisations that are set up with a commitment to some degree of transparency or accountability. And do they outsource elements of their operation? Because sometimes companies will absolve themselves of any possible guilt by just handing it over to a subcontractor and saying, oh, sorry, it was their fault. That happens oddly quite a lot. You can ask Gallup, for instance, the US organisation that did work in Iraq and was then sued for many millions of dollars. Sorry, I think over a billion dollars uh, by the US Justice Department for their work. So, you know, they said that of call. Ha 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 ha. Um, so, who's asking the question is obviously important, but perhaps more important even than that, what questions are they asking? Why? Because it's all about the phrasing. The questions that you ask will make a massive difference to the result you get. Let me give you an example. Imagine you wanted to do a survey about people who had killed their dog. Why would you want to do that? Because it's fun. Firstly, do you happen to have killed your dog? You could ask things that way. Secondly, as you know, many people have been killing their dogs these days. Do you happen to have killed yours? Or you could say, do you know any people who have killed their dogs? Uh, or you could say, which of the following corresponds most closely to the current state of your dog? All different ways of asking the same question to get the same data, but we'll all get slightly different responses. It's all about the phrasing. Let me give you another example from the real world. We don't actually run questions about dead dogs, but we do run questions about lots of subjects, and one question we, we ran was on abortion. This is the question that we ran. Currently, abortions are only legal up until the 24th week of pregnancy, except for cases of severe disability. Do you personally believe that the period during which a legal abortion can be performed should remain in 24 weeks, or should it be changed? So we asked people, should it remain, or should it be changed? And then as a follow-up question, we said, for those that said it should be changed, we said, well, should it be increased, or should it be decreased? What did we find from this? We found 46% of people favoured a decrease in the time limit of abortions. So that's one way of phrasing it. Let me show you another way that another company, God's own pollsters, who I won't name because it would be unfair for me to name comrades. Uh, let's see how they phrased their question when they ran something to get the same result. In the last year for which figures are available, government statistics show that 52 babies survived having been born earlier than 24 weeks. One specialist neonatal unit of Britain, five out of seven babies born at 22 weeks gestation survived. In light of this, do you think the upper time limit for abortion should be kept to 24 weeks, increased or decreased? In other words, hey, who wants to kill babies? What did we find? 72% favour a decrease. That is not the same as the question we asked. That finding is presented as the same as the question we asked. And so when you get MPs with an axe to grind over abortion, you don't see them quoting all the preamble, they just quote this on their evil, evil website. I, of course, am completely neutral about these things, <laughs> but uh, I just, uh, I just like to make that clear. So, it shows you how phrasing can make a massive difference. Other examples, agree-disagree statements are particularly bad. Why? Because they don't tell you anything about the subject, they just tell you whether people agree or disagree with the specific narrative that you're trying to test. They're very common because they're cheap and easily done, and so newspapers like them because they generate headlines and they're pretty simple. But you get problems. 
We ran this as an experiment. Britain should leave the European Union but maintain close trading links. Do you agree or disagree with the following statement? We found that 55% of people said they agreed with this statement. And then in the same survey, but in a different place in the survey, we ran a second question saying Britain should remain a full member of the European Union. What did we find? 55% of people said they agreed. Are they both wrong? No, they're both right. But what they're doing is not telling you the percentage of people that agree with withdrawal from the European Union. They're telling you what people, or what percentage of people agree with this particular narrative. So be careful of these things. And then, of course, the answer options are very important. We've talked about the preamble and the, the questions themselves. What about the answer options? This is something we were asked to run. In your opinion, what is the best thing that's become free? Interest-free credits or loans? CFC-free deodorant cans? Pensioners' bus passes? Entry to museums? Willie the Whale? Nelson Mandela? Other, please specify. Yeah, exactly. It's meaningless. What are they looking for? They're looking for some sort of, uh, some sort of percentage figures, and I assume for interest-free credits or loans. Yeah, quite. <laughs> <laughs> so, Think about the questions that are being asked. And when you're thinking about the questions that are being asked, think about, well, how are they asking the questions? There are different ways of asking questions, and all methods have advantages and disadvantages. Face-to-face -face research, for instance, there's an accurate representation of what, looks like, what it looks like when you do face-to-face -face research. Face-to-face -face research has many advantages, it also has many disadvantages, for instance, not least cost. It costs a lot of money to send people up and down the country, for example. Telephone research. Now, I should say at this point, uh, this is what's called a stock photo. And anyone who's ever commissioned research and looked for adverts for telephone research will find a photo much like this in, uh, in telephone research adverts. Uh, it's a, uh, a woman uh, who is attractive of sort of indeterminate ethnicity, smiling very nicely and looking very nice. Well, I've worked in telephone research, and I can assure you that the people that work in telephone research are not always exactly how they look in stock photos. So, uh, so be aware of that. Telephone. You can contact a lot of people in a short period of time. Geographically, you can contact more from central locations from all over the world. What you can't do is contact people who don't have telephones. And also, increasingly, a lot of people have mobiles and they don't answer. There are a lot of other advantages and disadvantages to both. I'm just going through them quickly. Online. Online research. This is what online research looks like. Uh, here I am at my computer. Um, and there are advantages and disadvantages to that. Not least, you can't contact people who aren't online. Uh, you can't talk to people who aren't on the internet. Uh, it doesn't stop shelter and other organisations asking us if we can speak to homeless people, for instance. Online. Um, it's an interesting one. Although the homeless guy at Old Street Station does have his own iPhone. So, yeah, who knows? Anyway. Um, online research, problematic. Um, Self-completion, I'm sure Arnold Schwarzenegger is not actually filling out a survey here, but he might be. Um, Self-completion, loads of advantages, loads of disadvantages as well, all, uh, all have to be considered. And then mixed mode, um, combining lots of different things to try and take advantage of the advantages of each of them. Great in theory, operationally very difficult and very expensive. So, how are the questions being asked, that's important. And when are they asking the questions? The time that a question takes place is hugely important. Why? Well, firstly, the context in which a question is asked can be hugely important in terms of, uh, in terms of how things evolve in terms of time. Um, to give you an example, back in the 80s, people asked questions about video on demand. So what's your attitude to video on demand? Or how likely are you to use video on demand? So for those of us who remember the 1980s, video on demand was very different back then. It means something completely different now. And so you can't compare results, even though the questions and the answer options and the sample may be exactly the same. Then there are some questions which simply are not asked anymore because they're not appropriate, because it's, language has moved on. My favorite example comes from Gallup. In the 1960s, they ran a series of questions over a number of months asking people which party is best in this country, which party is best able to deal with the problem of black people. They asked that month after month. Actually, I think it was coloured people. I'm not sure. Either it doesn't really matter, as far as I'm concerned. It's not something we're going to ask nowadays. Um, and so that can make, a, that can make a, a huge difference. But then also, there's my favourite example of timing, and that comes from 
capital punishment. Capital punishment questions. We hear a lot in this country, the majority of people support the return of uh, the death penalty for certain offences. We hear that a lot. And people point to historical data. They say, look, the majority of people asked the answer this and said they want it returned. But think about it. Who commissions a lot of this work? Newspapers. The newspapers just, out of the kindness of their heart, commission this work in isolation, just to find out? No. When do they commission it? Immediately after an atrocity. And so you get questions asked after the beheading of Drummer Rigby, after the London bombings, after the Soham killings. But that's not reported in the data. Instead, you always get the sense that people are having more fun than you. <laughs> I'm sorry about that. Um, so yeah, you don't get the data and the date presented as this was asked just after the, killer, uh, the London bombings. All you see is this was asked in July 2005. But clearly, events like that can have a massive difference on the results. And so it's something you need to think about, the context and the timing in which things are being asked. And then there's how is the data being analysed? And this comes, uh, this comes down to what we call statistical weighting. Statistical weighting, for those of you who aren't familiar with it, is a fine-tuning measure that's used to balance things, uh, balance things up. And, uh, and it's based on the principle that all are equal, but some are more equal than others. What that means is if you have slightly fewer women in your survey than you need to be representative, each one of those will count to 1.1 times or 1.2 times, and each man will count 0.9 times. So they're bumped up, they're bumped down, and the end result, the end weighted data, is representative of the population as a whole. In order to do that, you need target percentages. Target percentages are not always possible, but if you are going to get them, they're vitally important. They should come from large independent national surveys, and without target percentages, it's not possible to weight. You just have to run unweighted stuff. And your sample sizes must be sufficiently large. You don't want to wait for one old woman in Gloucester up to be representative of all women in Britain, for example. It's an extreme example, but nonetheless. You also need to think about, well, how are the results being reported? Now, there's a famous example in this country of bad reporting results. In fact, it's so famous, it was turned into the title of a quiz show. Our most famous example is this. Everyone loves cat pictures. Eight out of ten cats would buy whiskers. We had that throughout my childhood. Eight out of ten cats would buy whiskers. But in this country, it's inevitable we're going to find someone who's bored with nothing better to do than write to the Advertising Standards Authority and complain about such things. And someone wrote to the Advertising Standards Authority and said, 8 out of 10 cats were whiskers. They surveyed the cats, did they? And, uh, and so the Advertising Standards people went to Whiskers Cat Food and said, did you survey the cats? <laughs> and Whiskers said, no, we did not survey the cats, we surveyed the owners of the cats. And they said, well, you have to change your slogan then. And so the slogan was changed to 8 out of 10 owners said their cat preferred whiskers. At which point this person, you know, presumably when he wasn't writing to complain with Daily Mail, he's, he or she, not sure which, clearly got excited about this, and wrote back to the Advertising Standards Authority and said, well, hang on. Eight out of ten owners said their cats preferred whiskers. So does that mean that in the survey, 80% of all respondents said their cats preferred whiskers? And whiskers said, well, no, because actually when you ask owners, what does your cat prefer? The owners say, it's a cat. You put food in front of it, it eats it. In actual fact, a lot of people had said it doesn't have a preference, or they don't know, and things like that. It was only amongst those that named a specific brand that 80% of owners said their cats preferred whiskers. And so whiskers had to change their slogan again to... 8 out of 10 owners who expressed a preference said their cats preferred whiskers. At which point whiskers said, you know what, uh, forget it. <laughs> we're, uh, we're not doing this anymore. And they changed it to cats with white whiskers or something like that. Anyway, what's that example of? It's an example of one of the common mistakes that people make. 
when they do research. Insufficient sample sizes are a common mistake. Surveys based on 5, 10 people or cross breaks, the data broken down into a small number, a major, major problem. Rebased percentages, 8 out of 10 whiskers is an example of a rebased percentage. It's not, eight, it's not not 80% of the entire sample, it's 80% of a subsample, probably about 5% of the entire total. Percentage increase versus increase in percentage, I'll come on to that in just a minute. Stargazing, very popular with academics running analysis software. Oh look, it has stars on the results, that must mean it's significant and meaningful. No, it means probably neither, you need to check. False inferences and apophenia. Apophenia is the human tendency to find patterns in chaos. We'll come to that as well. And correlation versus causation. The favourite of these things. I'm going to go through some of these in turn. Firstly, increase in percentage versus uh, percentage increase versus increase in percentage. Let's say that unemployment is at 20%, and that means 2 million people are unemployed. You could say that there's an increase in percentage of 5%. So the 20% of unemployed plus 5 more percent unemployed means 25% are unemployed. That means 25% of the population equivalent to 2.5 million people. But if you do things a different way, there's a 5% increase. So 5% of 20%. And that means that you're looking at 2.1 million people, or 21% of the population. It's very easy to get those two muddled up, but as you can see, 0.4 of a million difference. 0.4 of a million? That's a good word, isn't it? Um, so, things you need to be aware of. False inferences and apophenia. Resorting to heuristics. Just because it makes sense, it must be true. Let me give you an example. Data shows a majority of students who are in relationships when they start at different universities from their partner split up within six months. People say, well, of course. Out of sight, out of mind. Everyone knows that. It's a well-known phrase we'll say. That must be correct. That data must be accurate. But then there's other data that shows a significant proportion of students who are in relationships when they start at different universities from their partner get married when they graduate. And people say, well, of course, absence makes the heart grow fonder. Everyone knows that. It's a well-known phrase we'll say. This data must be true. Which one is true? I don't know. I actually made them both up. But that's hardly the point. Uh, and then correlation versus causation. The old favourite, a common mistake journalists make. Let's look at it. Correlation. When ice cream sales rise, so do shark attacks. Does that mean the more ice cream you buy, the greater your risk of uh, being attacked by a shark? As vocabulary increases in infancy, so does appetite. Does that mean that learning new words makes you hungry? I think actually that is true. Uh, but, uh, but who knows? And my favourite one from the internet. If you plot, some of you may have seen this before, if you plot the number of pirates compared to the global uh, world temperature, you can actually work out that you can help fight climate change by becoming a pirate. Um, that's, uh, that's, that's what we've concluded from, uh, from that. Um, so, come on, common problem. So instead, when you look at analysis, think about the basic framework of analysis. This is what we use. We start with what we call top-line results, Top line results, we move to exploratory data analysis. Exploratory data analysis leads to advanced analysis, since this is a school of advanced study, I'm assuming that's your level. Um, but that would be things like regression, multivariate analysis, etc., etc. And from all of that, we draw conclusions. And at each stage, we incorporate what we call CVA, or contextual value add. So, in other words, the explanations around it, around it. Contextual, uh, contextual information. Top line results essentially are this. Just percentages, just the percentages of the total population, simple frequencies. Keep in mind, they don't always add up to 100. Why not? Because of rounding. And so they could add up to 99, they could add up to 101, and it doesn't necessarily mean that it's wrong. Exploratory data analysis takes the totals and then divides it up into subgroups. Here we've taken the total, but we've also divided things up into gender and age. And we've asked two questions about, uh, about TV. Now, this first question, you'll notice this certainly doesn't add up to 100. Why not? Because this is a multi-choice question. And these questions, similarly, they add up to 100, they're fine. This one doesn't, again, because of rounding. And these ones certainly don't, 
because it's more than a, because people can answer more than one option. And you'd be amazed at the number of people that get that wrong. I've had very angry journalists phone up saying, the numbers add up to 400% and I'm relatively sure that's wrong. It's just that each individual option should be 100%. So, in summary, the key questions to consider. Firstly, who commissioned the polling? Secondly, who's asking the questions? What questions are they asking? How are they asking the questions? When are they asking the questions? Who is answering the questions? How is the data being analysed? And how are the results being reported? These are the questions that you need to ask of any piece of data that you are working with in order to establish whether something is significant or meaningful. But lastly, as a good rule of thumb, may I point you in the direction of Twyman's Law. Now, I have a confession to make. I didn't come up with Twyman's Law. Twyman's Law was actually created by a guy called Tony Twyman, who's completely unrelated to me and works as a media researcher uh, down in South London. And actually, he doesn't have any words because he's retired. Um, but increasingly, I think I could have come up with it. So I'm sort of passing it off as my own. And Twyman's Law states, Anything that looks interesting or unusual is usually wrong. So that's a good rule of thumb. Is it interesting? That's probably wrong. Now. So just keep that in mind. But remember those key questions. Now, we've got, uh, got plenty of time for chat now. If you're interested, in, I've, I completely forgot I left this slide in here, but if you happen to be interested in the two and a half years that I spent in Baghdad, <laughs> you, can, uh, you can look up this article on the BBC website. Um, or we can talk about that now. Uh, the answer was, it was very hot and it was very dangerous. Uh, but, perhaps more importantly, if this is something that you're interested in, this, and this is something that you wish to pursue further, then, first, then firstly, you can email me any questions that you perhaps don't want to raise now. That sounded dodgier than it meant to be. And don't forget to follow me on Twitter. But also, I run a quantitative methods course in, uh, consultate in partnership with the Essex Summer School in Social Science Data Analysis. If this is something that you are interested in, then it's a two-week residential course, 35 hours of uninterrupted, uninterrupted quant methods. Can you imagine the number of cat pictures that you can fit in your 35 hours? <laughs> It's, uh, uh, in all seriousness though, it's, uh, it's a very, very good course, deliberately designed to supplement any quantitative research method, any theoretical quantitative methods that you've done, because it's very practical, uh, very based very much in practice and practical applications of quants. And so it's running through a lot of examples, a lot of exercises, and, uh, and a lot of practical tests and stuff like that. So, uh, I'm now going to sit down, but remember, two key rings, Four pens, four packs of cards, and a jigsaw are on offer for positive contributions. Go. Yes! What prize would you like? The jigsaw. <laughs> I said for the best. Best question. Aim high, right? Uh, yes, interesting, interesting moment. Um, so, seeing as you basically outlined all the mistakes that can be made and the fact that all the phrasing can make such a difference. Yeah. And also that these are companies, presumably to profit, uh, mm -hmm. etc. If all information is for sale, then can't you just buy the information that you want and then all of the methods can be used to suit what you sort of want out of it? Yes. Uh, well, I, I, get what you, uh, I get what you mean. The, the answer is, if you want to buy the answer that you're looking for, mm -hmm. you can do that. Uh, because there are organisations that will do it for you. But the question is why are you conducting the research? If you're conducting the research because you want to generate publicity and coverage, then there's no point running crappy questions mm -hmm. because no journalist will run with the, uh, will want, run with the results. Sure. And so instead, you need to go to an authoritative company because the gravitas that they bring to it ensures that, well, not necessarily in shorts, but certainly will help the possibility of, uh, of your work getting, uh, getting carried out. And most of the reputable agencies will not run questions that are not fair and are not balanced. And I reckon we probably turn away clients five or six times a week. Uh, 
may, well, I tell you, it's, it's from all different types of organisations. I mean, this is just my department uh, that does that. But uh, the, main, uh, the main people who cause us the most problems are actually pressure groups because they live and breathe their thing, whatever that thing is. It could be... Um, I'm glad you said that. It could be badger culling, for example. And let's say that there's an organisation that may or may not be commissioning work on badger culling and may or may not fail singularly to understand there might be two sides of the argument. And so, um, by the time it reaches me, it's usually because something... Uh, people just you know, sat there and said, I can't believe that anyone would believe that. I can't believe that people think that. I've asked all my friends, I've asked everyone in the office, they all think, I've asked everyone in this pressure group office, and they all think the same as me. What a surprise. Mm. Um, and, uh, and yeah, they're the, uh, they're the worst offenders. And actually, the most difficult uh, occasions you get is when it's something you really care passionately about, and you really support, mm. and you have to say to them, you are being a blithering idiot, mm. or words to that effect. Please run these fair questions. Don't try and get the result you want. Um, and as I say, most uh, most people will do it uh, will do it correctly. And if they won't, then we tell them to uh, go off. Do you, would you can sorry, um, to sort of, but would you consult with them about the questions, or would you just say yes, we'll take it on, go away, and we'll come and come back? And it, it depends on it depends on the client. Um, when we work with academic clients, most of the time they're pretty good, so they'll send sure. us they'll send us the questions and say. Uh, does anything need adjusting here, and I'll suggest one or two things. It always works best as part of a two-way collaborative process. Uh, but sometimes, yeah, sometimes we'll get people contacting us saying, look, we just want to do a survey to find out what, it, well, let me give you, let's use Badger Culling as an example. In the best case scenario, we'll get a phone call saying, hi guys, we're pro Badger Watch. Um, we, uh, we really love badgers, and we want to know what percentage of the population agrees with us? We're not very good at research. And we we'll continue that joke. We're not, we're not very good at research, so we'd like your advice on what questions we should ask. That's one end of the scale. The other end of the scale is, hello, Pro Badger Watch here. We'd like to ask the question, badgers are lovely and cuddly, should they be horribly killed? <laughs> yes or no, of course not, that would be dreadful. Thank you. And so uh, those are two ends of the scale, and people fall somewhere in between the two. Um, and, and as I say, it's pressure groups that tend towards the nasty end of the scale, and you just have to say, well, I'm sorry, but, uh, but we're not running this, we're not doing this. If you don't like then go off. Good question, though. Uh, uh, I take the card, I take some cards. Take the cards? Well, yeah. no, I, I'm sorry, I want to take the cards. Okay. <laughs> take the cards. You said in this question of how to make sure that you incorporate the statistical range for who's asking the question, um, how do you deal with this question of gender? Because um, certainly when you're doing uh, interviewing, mm -hmm. but it, statistically it has been suggested that middle-aged female interviewers tend to be more empathetic than, say, young um, male students interviewing older leaders, etc. Um, I'm just using that as an analogy, I'm not saying that's necessarily right. But how do you take into consideration that sort of factor where the questioner can't do anything about their age or their gender? Yeah, uh, well, uh, YouGov, we do 99.9% .9 of our work online. Yeah. And so, therefore, you get a, um, you get a blank mm -hmm. screen to, uh, to respond to. Um, and it's funny you should ask about the question of sensitivity generally, because uh, YouGov was responsible back in 2004 for conducting the largest ever survey of uh, Britain's sexual fantasies. And um, if you want to see the results, they're available from all good Amazons. Uh, it's not a great read, if, I, uh, if I'm being completely, uh, completely frank. But what, what we found was that online research was the only way of doing that, because there was no way that a middle-aged woman, of which face-to-face -face research in this country tend to be, there was no way uh, that a yeah that a, a middle-aged woman asking an 18-year-old boy, so uh, 
tell me about your sexual fantasies. That wasn't going to happen if Alan Copley got arrested, um, unless they worked at the BBC. Uh, we'll cut that out. And so, um, and so we couldn't do that, but by the same token, we couldn't get an 18-year-old boy to ask a middle-aged woman, tell me about your sexual fantasies. And so online was really the only way to uh, the only way to do that. Having said that, clearly there are some instances where actually being asked by a middle-aged woman is beneficial. Sometimes there will be times when asking by an eighteen-year-old boy is beneficial. But it's always a matter of uh, it's always a matter of judgment. When I was in Iraq, uh, which is always a good way to begin a sentence, um, we had to be very careful of cultural considerations there. And we knew that, for instance, women would have to ask questions of women, men would have to ask questions of men, but more than that, Sunni would have to ask questions of Sunni, Shia would have to ask questions of Shia, Kurds would have to ask questions of Kurds. And so it becomes part of the project management process. And the problem is, uh, the problem tends to arise when that question is not considered because there's always a solution to it. So, so it goes back to the initial planning. Exactly. So it goes back to the initial planning and, and asking, how is this question, how is this survey being asked? Mm -hmm. uh, sorry, was it? <laughs> yes. <laughs> uh, I was doing a piece of research that asked uh, does the research show that women tend to transparent with our data and so to say look these are our results this is what we have found and this is what we think it means based on the following assumptions etc etc and we think that's really the the least worst way of doing it if you like and uh, and and again at least that way people can then if people don't agree with it you can start a conversation about why they don't agree with it rather than just oh I don't agree with that well I think it's right Yes. Hi, I have a question. It's um, similar to uh, the lady. But um, if you, yes, you said the uh, question is all about the phrasing. And if you wanted to uh, do the research to a particular group, like the children or some in the in immigration groups or some extra job, um, how will you find the best? to find the things you want? Yeah, I mean, that's a, that's a good question because, and again, there's no, there's no easy answer. Um, the most obvious example that we come across is, uh, I mean, I, I head up all the political research across Europe, and running a question with a particular wording in England and, uh, indeed, Britain and Wales, uh, Britain more generally, can that particular question wording can mean something different in Germany or France, even if it's a straight translation. And, um, and in all of those cases, the solution is to, as far as you can, test the survey on local, uh, on, on people within that group and analyze exactly what it is they're, uh, they're telling you. For a lot of our larger projects, uh, we do qualitative surveys, and so, sorry, qualitative interviews 
with respondents, asking them, okay, what do you understand by that? What do you think that means? Your answer, what exactly is that, uh, is that saying? And so we'll do that to see, as far as possible, whether effectively the question is working. Because you can never, you can never know for sure. And, uh, and even if one question is interpreted by one person in a particular way, it may be interpreted in another way. Now there are steps you can take to try and tie down those questions to remove the ambiguity, but you can never be entirely, uh, entirely sure. And so, as I said, the more you can test, the better, uh, the better it will be. Um, as for your own period experience, um, how, how many times so you could test um, um, to make sure the questions is, you know, the, maybe the best? How? Um, we get asked. Uh, we get asked a lot, uh, <laughs> and we get asked, uh, "Are you sure this is the right way to ask it?" Um, and and there are various rules that you can apply. I mean, a good a good rule of thumb is: uh, uh, Can you tell from the question? Uh, whether a particular, whether the person commissioning the work is looking after, is looking out for a particular answer or not, um, is it fair? Is it balanced? All these things are things that you can, that you can incorporate to try and uh, to try and ask. But but again, in, uh, in my experience, we have arguments about questions every day, uh, and and you never. Sometimes you just never. You never really know. Um, we uh, I had a big argument with a guy. Um, uh, big argument on Twitter, so it doesn't really count. <laughs> with, a, with a guy who's, um, who's involved with the Labour Party who was annoyed about the fact that we had asked a question about which party was best able to handle the economic situation. And he said, well, what about, wouldn't it be better to ask which party is best able to handle the economy? Or which, uh, or he came up with, uh, with some other, uh, some other, a couple of other phrasings. And, and they all essentially measured the same thing, but they're all slightly different. Which was the right answer? Well, there's no right or wrong answer, really, except that I felt I was right. <laughs> so, uh, and actually we tested the various different things and it turned out that the other ones were less favourable to the Labour Party, uh, which uh, upset him. Um, I've got a question about, for instance, if there's a particular cohort that you're aiming at, say, 16 to 18 year olds in the upcoming Scottish referendum. Yeah. So a very clear cohort. Do you have um, optimum patterns for repeat polling? How do you factor in? Are you asking the same people you know, a repeat question? Have they changed their minds over time? Are you asking, if you're doing random sampling, you could indeed include those same people as before, mm -hmm. but you could be asking a completely different group of 16 to 18 year olds. So how do you deal with, with something like that? Uh, it depends really on, uh, on, how you want to, on how you want to approach it. Um, we're working with the British election study out of uh, at Manchester University, Nottingham University, uh, which is the largest well, just an academic survey of its type in, uh, in Britain, and they're doing an awful lot on the Scottish referendum because uh, things like that don't come along very often and it's all very exciting. And 16 to 18 year olds, of course, are very important to them. What they want to do is they want to contact, uh, contact 16 to 18 year olds and create a panel and return to those people on a regular basis. Other organisations that we work with want to go to new people every time. Now, there are advantages and disadvantages of both, and again, neither one is necessarily right or, uh, right or wrong from the academic point of view. They wish to measure individual level change, in which case you need to attend to the same people, the same people every time. And then with regards to the frequency of return, we've, one of the things we've tested is, does the frequency at which people are asked influence their decisions in, uh, in any way? And again, that comes down to the type of question you're asking. If you're asking people um, unprompted awareness of the, um, of the Scottish referendum campaign, for instance, You've already asked them a series of questions about it. You've already raised that, and so that might work first time when you're establishing the panel, but not for subsequent things. For a fresh sample of people, then it's a it's a valid question to uh, to ask. So, like all like so many of these things, it comes down to one of the specifics of the project. What is it that you're actually looking for? And again, as I said in the, in the case of the Scottish referendum, the most important thing for the academic clients is this issue of individual level change. So that's more important to them and other stuff, and so it's more important to stick with a panel approach and, uh, and so on and so forth. Oh, oh, so a question here. Please. Yes. Oh, um, you, when you spoke about the margin of error, you mentioned that um, when something falls outside the margin of error, that's when you know it's statistically significant. Yeah. But then you went on to say that um, when you use non-random something or non-probability something, yeah. which most people do use, that's when you have to move away from speaking about the margin of error. Yeah. So then how do you know something is well, then you, you simply 
Can you notice truly statistically significant with non probability No, you can't, uh, because it relies on it relies on that. Well, it's slightly more complicated than that. You can do uh, you can do some sort of things that get closer to statistical significance using the um, uh, using the weighting uh, the um, weight efficiency and things like that, and the, uh, and the actual sample size rather than the relative sample size. Etc. Et it gets very, it gets very confusing. In all, so the alternative is to just work out what would be an appropriate margin of error. As I say, to use the uh, to use the different ways that people uh, people put it. See what the people who have commissioned the work believe the margin of error to be, and then work it out from uh, from there. But in terms of true statistical significance, it's not possible to do. Uh, you next, I think. <laughs> So um, I was really interested to hear about this, the, the when you were asking the questions thing, obviously like, you know, all, all the responses from back then are very different to what they would do now, yeah. but like, have you ever sort of, I guess, like, there's obviously things happen all the time and there's big flare-ups in the media about all sorts of stuff, especially yeah. politically, have you ever um, had to sort of adjust the timing of something to avoid that sort of knee-jerk response? On sensitive issues that are sort of flaring up in the media, or like, have you ever planned to do a survey and then say oh, we've got to like pull it because you know um, major immigration or terrorism or racist things happen and you don't want the results to be swayed by it? Uh, yeah, well, um, yes. Is the, the short answer is uh, is yes. We um, in that instance we do a lot, we do a lot of tracking surveys. We run surveys every day, yeah. up, and the data's on our website if you're interested. Uh, but what we're interested in is the distinction between what we call V-shaped trends and L-shaped trends. And V-shaped trends are blips, so the shape of a V. Uh, you have the trend, there's a V, something happens, a shock, you get a V and then it recovers to where it was before. We call that V-shaped trend. And you get a lot of V-shapes uh, as, um, as a result of the news agenda. And so uh, David Cameron gives a positive speech, uh, conservatives blip up, uh, Ed Miliband does something, <laughs> um, uh, and they blip down, and so on and so forth. But it's the long-term trends in that instance that we're interested in. But for one-off surveys, uh, sometimes, in fact, uh, for a number of academic clients that we're working with, we have the surveys ready to go, we're just waiting for the news event to happen. Uh, so that could be the reverse, uh, the reverse situation. So we're waiting to see what people, um, what people think about. Uh, and. Um, and so, uh, in the past, we've done things on deaths in Afghanistan, for instance. So, how do people respond in the aftermath of a death in oh, Afghanistan? Yeah. So, that's an example of that. But at the same time, we pulled surveys or, did, or postponed surveys because they can just um, uh, they can just be at the wrong time. We, um, we're doing a survey on attitudes to international, uh, international aid uh, for a large foundation. And, um, and just as we're about to launch, there was an emergency, um, emergency appeal that went out. Uh, and we've been planning the survey for six months. And so what happened? Well, we just had to wait a couple of months because it wasn't going anywhere. But that was the first of a five-year study. And so we didn't want the first one to, uh, to show that things went down because we knew it was an unusual situation. What is an L-shaped trend? An L well, an L-shaped trend is the opposite of a V-shaped trend. That's when there's a shock. So you have a trend, there's a shock like an L, and then it carries on on a different, uh, on a different uh, thing. And, um, and L-shaped trends are far less frequent than, um, uh, than B-shaped trends. My favourite example of this, actually, uh, was um, when we were running a survey on the death penalty, actually. And I, I wanted to do it in isolation. Uh, and I wanted to do it um, across Europe at the same time. And to coordinate with all the different countries across Europe to find a time when no one is getting, you know, uh, is getting threatened with the death penalty is <laughs> actually quite well, difficult. And we ran it, uh, so we ran it in lots of different countries, and my Norwegian colleagues contacted me and said, we don't want to run the survey, uh, because it was during the time when Andrus Brevik was, um, uh, was being tried. Yeah. And he was saying, I am ashamed of these results. I'm ashamed that, uh, that they look so high for Norway. I mean, I'm ashamed of the bloodlust that it appears my people have, that we are not like this. This is clearly an unusual situation. Um, and I said, well, I, I completely understand that. Look, we're going to, let's see the results, let's run with it, let's caveat it, let's put on there, 
uh, that this is the uh, this is the case. And he, he sent the results through, and, um, and it was sort of support and jumped to, to something like twenty <laughs> percent compared, compared to Britain, nothing. Um, and, but it was culturally significant for uh, for him, and uh, and so yeah, it may have it may have doubled, but it was still only half of what it was in uh, uh, here, where we you know we love a good hanging. Um, so so yeah, and, and what can you do in that situation? You can't. Um, we we ran the survey, we ran the results, and we put. Wait, wait, you would say that that was that was not significant, but that was significant to Norway. So we. Wait, so you're very down to meaningful and significant to entirely culturally weak. Yes, yeah, in that, yes, in that instance, it was certainly, uh, certainly culturally, uh, culturally meaningful, and culturally and statistically significant. Yes. Um, please speak to the more details about how to ask the questions, please. Um, for example, if I wanted to do some online research, yeah. and I wanted to. Uh, sending the questionnaires to the possible uh, respondents. The only methods I know is just sending them the emails and ask, invite them to um, ask questions on something on like the server monkey or, or some tools yeah. like that. So to have any. Uh, well, in terms of suggestions, firstly use Qualtrics rather than survey monkey. Um, and most academic institutions in this country have a license for it, so we do it for free. Uh, but um, in, t in terms of asking the question, I mean, we've got like 15 minutes left, and the introduction to question writing that I run lasts three hours. Uh, this course. <laughs> just, uh, just putting it out there. Um, as, a general, as a general rule, well, a few general rules. Firstly, fair and balanced. Secondly, um, as many people should be able to answer it as possible. Thirdly, remove all possible ambiguity. So uh, those are the uh, those are the things. And then for for how you actually get people to answer the surveys, uh, it's it depends entirely on how many people you want to answer and what your budget is. If you're um, if you don't have any money. <laughs> Yes. As in literally <laughs> no money, then there is no alternative to just emailing your friends oh. and uh, and getting them to go onto a Qualtrics survey. Is that is that actually great data? No, probably not. Um, but is it better than no data? Maybe, not definitely, <laughs> but um, but it may be. So um, so yeah, it, it's a uh, it's a difficult um, it's a difficult one. Uh, and there is, there's no, unfortunately, there's no alternative to, to actually, if you, if you want a representative sample of the population, unless you want to do the travelling up and down the country yourself to, uh, to get those things, then there is, uh, there is no alternative. The other thing, the other way you could do it is to approach it um, as a sort of qualitative exercise, to go back to what we were talking about before, and you just speak to a small number of people, but you speak to them in a great amount of detail. And ask them open-ended questions and, uh, and things like uh, things like that. But that's moving away from, um, from the sort of thing that I was talking about this evening. So, if I wanted to, you know, the group I research is about three hundred. So, if I wanted to get more details about interview face to face, what's the, what do you think is the um, appropriate number that I should add to? So, hang on, the total population you want to yeah. survey is three hundred. Yeah. Okay, in that case you just need to get as many people as you can. Um, and the, the appropriate level depends on, uh, depends on how, um, how clear cut the results are. Let's say you ask, you're, asking someone, um, you're asking someone whether they like a particular film or not. Uh, and you've got 300, you want to test 300 people, a population of 300 people, and you want to see whether the film is good or not. If you speak to, uh, if you speak to a certain number of those people and you find that 90% of people like the film and 10% don't, you can be pretty sure that even despite the large margin of error, people still like the film. But if it's 49, 51, mm -hmm. you have no idea what the, uh, where the true data lies. So it's just, in that instance, it's just a matter of maximizing, uh, maximizing the sample size in order to minimize the margin of error in order to maximize the significance of the meaningful. When you're doing surveys from your side of things, do you have an optimal number of those that you think should be sampled? Because you had that graph where the mm. margin of error started to flatten, mm. and you talked about, well, 
you know, is the cost return necessarily yeah. significant for that extra number of people pulled? Do you have a mental cut off point yourself? Uh, yeah, I mean, we, we usually do between 1,500 and 2,000. Mm -hmm. And the reason for that is it's between 500 and 1,000 more than our, uh, than our competitors used to do. And so it, it comes down to business and commercial considerations, but also psychological things. Newspapers, generally speaking, like a thousand as a minimum. Why? For no other reason than it's a thousand. So it's just it's a, it's a nice yeah, it's a nice number. It sounds large, sounds serious. It doesn't actually. Their love of that has no basis in um, no basis in, in theory. Uh, we do we do an awful lot of work with people that say. Um, uh, I want, I want 10,000. They say, we can have 10,000, but the results will be very similar to 5,000. Uh, and they say, yeah, but I want 10,000 because I want the largest survey of this type ever, and things like, things like that. So, uh, so most of the time, in my experience, the considerations come from, well, this is separate from sort of if they want to contact a very large group in order to drill down to a specific group within that. So for the British election study, for instance, we're looking at 20,000 people because... The 20,000 is great, obviously, but that then means that the number of 18 to 24 year olds will be sufficiently large. The number of 16 to 18 year olds will be large as well. Um, whereas in a sample of 1,000, it's about 30 people, which is much, uh, it's a much use at all. And so there's that consideration, but most of the time it comes down to what sounds good and what looks good. Okay, I've got one last question. What did you think of the guy in the States who looked at all the polling stats in each individual state and managed to pull the result of the Electoral College and the presidential election. What do you think of the man's Nate Silver, are we talking about? What do I think about Nate Silver? What do I think about Nate Silver while the camera is still on? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, and was that good maths? Nate Silver is a good statistician, but I don't think he's an amazing statistician. I, I mean, what was interesting about Nate Silver, for those of you that aren't familiar with it, he was the, he was the person, the, supposedly the person who correctly predicted the, uh, the election. And, and yes, he did, but he wasn't the only one. Uh, there were people like Simon Jackman from the University of Stanford, who's, who I met and, and indeed know, and he's the smartest person I've ever met. I mean, he is scarily clever. He operates on another intellectual level. And, and he, although he's very nice and he's very kind, you kind of get the feeling that he's looking at you thinking, you are just one small step up from an A. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and as I say, he, he does that in the nicest possible way, but he's just so smart and so clever. And he came up with an incredibly sophisticated, high-level stats thing that essentially got to the same answer. There's a guy called Alex Wang from um, Princeton who did a very similar thing. I think that was his name. And they all came to the same result through various different what made Nate Silver different was not the strength of his maths. It wasn't the strength of his statistics. It was his ability to communicate what were quite complicated arguments mm -hmm. to the common man, if you like, for want of a better expression. So he made it uh, he made it possible for the average person in the street and a lot of and the half of the world less knowledgeable than the average person in the street. He made it possible for them to understand what it was, what he was doing, and why he was, uh, and why he was doing it. And um, and he did that in a clever, and intelligent, and articulate way. And also, to be quite frank, he he looks slightly geeky, but not too geeky. And he looks slightly political, but not too political. And he uh, and he's not sort of massively unattractive as uh, as some polls are. And so so he makes for a good, safe person to have on TV. On the other hand, you could say that he's an excellent communicator, which academics need to be when we're looking at quantitative data. Oh, yeah, yeah. It's no good wrapping it up, it being excessively complicated, because otherwise the point you're making gets lost. Yeah, abs absolutely, absolutely. Uh, so, and that's, that's so, I've seen that so many times at, at academic conferences across the world, when people turn up and fl fling a whole load of Greek letters and equations on the board to prove something. And actually, if you sit there, like, sit there really, I mean, I have to sit there really hard, sort of staring at this, thinking, what? Uh, and at the end of it, you just about understand what they're saying. And what they're saying is really interesting, but they're unable to, uh, to express it. And, and so, Nate, yeah, Nate Silver and people like him um, are, able to, are able to do that far more effectively. And so it's the way they present their stuff 
whether it's journalistically or um, or in terms of the media that uh, that makes it uh, that makes it effective. Plus, also the fact that Nate didn't have any uh, any particular uh, baggage with a particular uh, with a particular ideology. I mean, he is he is liberal, he is a Democrat, but he doesn't let that influence his results in a way that people such as Unskewed Polls or Carl Rove uh, at Fox News, um, who famously uh, basically lost his uh, lost his mind, basically. <laughs> um, but to, to give you a, just before we go, I have an anecdote from. Um, uh, from that election, I was uh, I was lucky enough to be invited to the U.S. ambassador's house on election night, which was pretty fun. Um, and McDonald's do the catering. But yeah, it's true. It's true. McDonald's, McDonald's do the catering, and uh, so you get these people dressed in like white tie, the waiters and waitresses with silver service, walking around with trays filled with Big Macs. Big Mac, sir. Big Mac, sir. McFly, sir. All night long. Um, it's really weird. But anyway. <laughs> At the U.S. Ambassador's, I actually met one of the few Republicans there, and, uh, and I was talking to her about the polls, and she said, well, you're a pollster, um, what do you think is going to happen? I said, well, Obama's going to win, I mean, everyone knows that. And I said, well, you might think that if you listen to mainstream polling. I thought, well, what is mainstream polling? What does that mean? And she said, well, you know, if you, you, know, if you, if you try with maths and science to do polling, then yes, it says that Obama's going to win. But if you look beyond that, if you look at the number of people turning up to, uh, see him, to see Romney speak, if you look at the number of lawn signs for Romney, you'll see that really he's on for a landslide. And I just thought, are you actually mental? Is, uh, is, this, is this it? it is, has Republicanism now become synonymous with some sort of strange denial? And, uh, and the answer was a yes. And uh, then, of course, when the results came through, I was desperately trying to find her again. But I think she'd either exploded or left, or possibly both. Um, but, uh, but that really opened, uh, opened up to me just how Blinken suddenly won. Because so much of American discourse, particularly, uh, particularly on cable news, is all about our pollster shows this. Uh, it's no surprise that someone neutral like, uh, like Nate was able to... Uh, able to get in there, because it's not like in this country, I mean, I'm in a privileged position of hating all politicians, mm -hmm. and, um, and so, and so I, I, although I have very strong opinions about certain subjects, uh, I can quite easily go on TV and say, yeah, this person's an idiot, this person's an idiot, this person's done something right, this person's done something right, um, but in the States, it's all, oh, so-and-so's a pollster for, um, he was Clinton's pollster, he was um, Bush's pollster, and now he's a pundit. And what do they do? They sit there and say, oh yeah, well, uh, you're wrong, my lot will right. It goes back to that lies, lies, and bad statistics. Yeah. So, okay, thanks very much indeed. Uh, just, before, just before I finish, I am not taking this home. <laughs> so, uh, you may have the jigsaw. Yeah, exactly. Only if you come on my side. But thanks very much. <laughs>